Hello and welcome to this repair tutorial and today we're going to look at a Kenwood KA-1030 amplifier. This unit was released for sale around 1991 and as with most Kenwood products it's sold in good numbers often forming part of a stack system with a tuner, cassette uh, and also a turntable and often a graphic equalizer thrown in. And then for general specifications we're looking at a power output for RMS is 65 watts per channel into 8 ohms and then that will increase then to 70 watts if you have a 4 ohm speaker load. The amplifier has two speaker selections so when you look towards the headphone socket you can go speaker selection A or B or both on or both off. And total harmonic distortion is good so it's coming in at 0.03% for a frequency range of 20 hertz through to 20 kilohertz. Uh, because you can connect a turntable directly, you don't need any form of equaliser or preamp. It will accept a moving magnet type cartridge, and that's a 2.5 millivolt input signal. And then for your line inputs at 150 millivolts, you can connect your tuner, tape or CD. And you also have a loudness switch as well, and also a mute switch, which typically uh, takes it down by about minus 20 dB. And then for your CD or direct mode, sometimes this is a little bit confusing. It's actually your tone defeat and what you're doing is you connect to your CD input and then if you press that button it will eliminate the tone control circuits and that sort of comes into its own when you're doing fault finding uh, but I'll go into a little bit more detail because one of the issues uh, was relative to the tone board on this amp. And then headphone socket for personal listening and then overall dimensions. Height wise is 137 millimeters, width is 440 and then depth comes in at 280 millimeters with a weight of 6.7 kilograms. And overall build quality is very good as with many Kenwood products. And I would also say as a repair engineer, it's easy to work on. It's both modular in its construction and the quality of the circuit boards and components used throughout is very good. And the electrolytic capacitors in here are Elna type. So give good longevity and performance. So what was the issue when this amplifier came into the workshop? Well, it had multiple issues. Uh, one of them being that when you sort of put it onto test mode, you kind of had intermittent sound loss, sometimes on the left channel or on the right channel. And this is very, very common of an amplifier of this age. And of course, that issue could be down to, for example, the volume control potentiometer may be deemed dirty or the volume. Or more commonly, what you have is the output protection relay for the speakers. Uh, where it has oxidized or worn contacts and that was the issue here it was the relay and if you sort of give it a little bit of a tap with the insulated part of a screwdriver handle you could hear the sound come back you know intermittently so in terms of getting into the amplifier you know very very easy to do so i'll just show from uh, now the rear of the amplifier and it's just a case of just removing the fixing screws but what I will also bring to your attention as well is you have the option to select 8 ohm speakers or lower and then you may have to move this slide switch across to increase that if you go maybe up to 16 ohms. What I'm also showing you is this slide switch removed and the reason why I've done that is that the contacts on the switch became oxy or have become oxidized and dirty. So rather than you adding sort of like to the impedance, you know, it's not going to be a super high level of resistance. But if it did make an intermittent contact, you know, it's not going to help the amplifier and it's not going to help your speaker. So what I've done and what I'm showing is the before and after. So you can see the oxidization on the slide switch. And then what I do is I clean it off with a fiberglass pencil and then apply some uh, deoxid grease onto there just for some longevity, reassemble and then put it back into the amp then. And then the next thing that I'm showing you is with the rear cover removed, you can see the input board. Now, this amplifier, which is a very nice feature, doesn't use a mechanical switch to select the different inputs. What you have is the dedicated IC, which is just at the upper part here above the RCA phono sockets. And that's a integrated circuit. And the command signal then goes to there to select your different options. Now, as with all amplifiers which you will be working on or which may come into your workshops or maybe you're just looking to repair one, if it's of a particular age and vintage, always make sure that you just scan those boards for dry joints. Often where you have mechanical connections, 
the solder connections will break away from the board. So what I do here is I'm just simply doing a systematic approach, and I always reference to that. And what I do is I'll flow all of the boards to ensure that there are no dry joints. And in some cases, you know, there was some dry joints with this amplifier, but no issue there, you know, we, we sort of took care of them. And then I'm also showing you next, which is just the really sort of the solder side of the input board, as you can see here. And then once that was done, what I do is, and what I'm showing you now, is the power input fuse. And you can see here on the power input board, you know, it's quite simplistic. There's not an additional startup circuit that you, when you push the power on button, it will apply the power. But what I will do from time to time is, if the amplifier is very old, then I would replace these fuses as standard, particularly anti-surge fuses and also non-anti-surge. What you can find is some of these fuses kind of go resistive. And I also just make sure that the clip either side of the fuse on the holder just make sure that that's tensioned correctly and it's not got it sort of any intermittent and again as I said a moment ago you're also checking them for dry joints and then the next area that I'm focusing on is the main amp board and again very very easy to get access to this there's just a few fixing screws and then what I'm able to do is just to lift up that board and you can see here that you have the relay and you know, I suppose you could remove the top cover plate from the original relay and clean the contacts. Well, you know, I prefer to replace the relay with a seal type, so reduces the likelihood of oxidisation. And I don't sort of take any time, you know, to sort of do any sort of tests or anything like that. It's just a routine function that's performed. Take the relay out and then replace it with a modern, brand new equivalent. And the specification for this ray, relay is 24 volts DC and coil and then it's a double pole changeover relay two sets of contacts for either one of the speakers and you know these are commonly available now once that was done what i then paid my attention to is the front tone board as with any amplifier oxidization and dirt and grime form onto the user control potentiometers so you need to spray into there a high quality switch cleaner or contact cleaner and also for the additional switches as well, where you can, for example, select the uh, direct mode, CD direct mode, or maybe the speaker A or B selection push buttons. Again, spray into there, work these switches multiple times, and what you'll find is it will clear off any oxidization. If you've got a noisy volume control potentiometer, again, you can leave the amplifier powered up, and what I tend to do is just drop a set of headphones on, and then I'll spray into there, leave it a few minutes just to sort of work its way and then I'll rotate the volume control potentiometer backwards and forwards multiple times and I'm just listening with the headphones and often you'll find like a crackle at the top end or maybe halfway but backwards and forwards and then you'll find that that will clear and then there will be no sort of residual noise then. Now when you get access to the volume control potentiometer and also the tone control uh, sort of treble bass and balance control potentiometers on this amplifier, it's what we call a D-shaft type. Um, what I'm showing here is a bit of a hack. And again, you might want to sort of make a note for this. Often with these, these knobs that just push onto there, it's like a plastic, um, almost like a, a, a plastic sort of cover. Um, what you'll find is over time they become hardened. So it, it sort of loses its ability to flex. And what you can find is that these knobs really are very, very loose on the shaft of the potentiometers. Now, normally on many amplifiers, what you'll find is if you remove them, there's like some masking tape which is wrapped around the D-shaft. That's common, but sometimes you can't, you know, sort of wrap that much masking tape around there. The, you know, it gets a little bit ridiculous. So what I do <clears throat> is I take a 100 millimeter cable tie, and I'm showing you. And then what I'll do is I'll form that just as a loop around the uh, volume or, or around the knob and then just pull it tight then and then just cut it off and then what you'll find is that that will go onto the shaft and it will be very solid now you can also use this hack as well if one side of the um, <coughs> push fit part of the control is broken away remember you've still got the other part and again by forming that loop you should be able to make a collar 
and then just slide it on and that will save you a lot of hunting around trying to find an equivalent knob to use or maybe you can't you know you can't find one then what i tend to say sort of avoid glue if you can in these areas you know the last thing you want to do is sort of accidentally glue the uh, the knob onto the shaft and then if you have to do any work in the future you know you're probably going to damage the potentiometer you know trying to remove it then and then what was the sort of the the sort of test phase for this amplifier well because of its age often what i've remarked on the repair blogs is you've got to get the amplifier back to a position where maybe you can do further testing and fault finding so when i talk about doing the dry joints I talk about replacing the speaker protection relay, cleaning the user control potentiometers. That really gives it to, to a base position that then I can then enter into a test phase. So the next test phase here was to power, of course, the amplifier up via the dim bulb tester. And I'll put a link to that in the description. But during the test phase, it became apparent that if you selected CD direct mode, both the left and right channels, the audio output and quality was identical, no issue. But as soon as you deselected the CD direct mode and then selected maybe the tuner input, what you then found was that the right channel, there was very, very low audio, almost uh, muffled to a point and no sort of top end or bottom end. But that indicates, and I sort of mentioned this earlier, that if you have that CD, CD direct mode, you can isolate if the fault is on the main amplifier board or if it's in the tone control circuit. So I knew straight away that there was an issue with tone control. And what I show in the video is the tone control board. And then what I'm pointing to here is the defective component. Now, I'm showing you an extract from the service manual. And you can see here that you have an operational amplifier. And the components that I'm referencing here are C14 and C13, and it was C14 which was defective. Uh, but rather than just replace the one capacitor, I've replaced both of them. And the value of those are 4.7 microfarad, and they're rated at 16 volts. And all that had simply happened was that C14, when you kind of took it out of circuit, you could see it was a little bit crusty around the terminal, so you know it had sort of leaked at some point and, and sort of dried out and when you put it on the ESR meter you know it's way out very very high resistance and hardly any sort of capacitance value at all now they are Elner capacitors so again replace them with the equivalent type and during test phase after that work was done then you got again really really high quality audio on both channels uh, whether or not you selected the tone circuit or not so for that, you know, it's not a complicated fault. And again, there's not a lot going on on this tone control circuit. I suppose the schematic looks a little bit complicated, but, you know, these are just normal operational amplifiers with fixed feedback networks. And then depending on, you know, if you're doing your treble or your bass, then you'll be altering the feedback network then to uh, increase and also to filter specific frequencies. But you can see where the input signal comes in via this 4.7 microfarad capacitor. So, of course, being high in value and, and uh, high ESR and then uh, low in value, then, you know, the, the correct audio frequency level was not getting passed through and also being heavily attenuated as well. And then once that part was resolved or that issue was then fixed, the next thing that I needed to pay my attention to was to just verify that the output bias for each of the channels was correct. Now, as with many amplifiers, over time, what you find is that the circuits can age and you can get some drifting around these initial sort of um, bias measurements and, and uh, settings. So it was quite high. You know, the bias output for both channels should be at nine millivolts. Normally, manufacturers will say plus or minus one millivolt. And the way in which you do the adjustment, very easy. And you can see this within the video later. You can see that the emitter resistors are... Uh, vertically uh, mounted and then what they have done during manufacture they just extend the fixing leads and you're able to clip on your multimeter and again I'll show this in the video and then what you're able to do then is just to adjust those bias trimmers until you reach approximately nine millivolts now be aware that you can do like an initial set uh, setting maybe you set it you know it's a sort of like six or seven millivolts or maybe ten or twelve millivolts 
leave the amplifier running for about 20 minutes stable environment you know don't have anything drafty going on and then if you find that the bias potentiometers may be a little bit sort of twitchy you know turn the amplifier off spray the presets with the oxid or high quality contact clean just work them backwards and forwards multiple times return them back to original position roughly and then you should find that you're able to adjust the bias you know really really easily then the nice part with this extract is you can see the entire circuit so you can see where the left and right channel audio comes in to the uh, voltage amplifier stage then the driver stage and then the output stage and then it goes all the way through and I've also made reference here and you can see that these are the switching contacts which are used for the speaker protection and as I said you know these amplifiers are well built also as well the quality of the audio that the amplifier produces is very very good so I was you know, sort of impressed with that um, and, and a pleasure to work on you know so really sort of a number of faults here which we've done so just sort of quick recap for yourselves first off we had the intermittent loss of audio which is down to the oxidization on the relay contact so just replace that relay and then also take care of any dry joints on the board there is a physical clean because it was dusty but you know I sort of mentioned that in detail just use maybe a compressed airline or uh, a stiff brush just to clear that out and then clean your user control potentiometers make sure they're all good and as I said the uh, the other issue was just applicable to the tone control board where we had the uh, open circuit effectively capacitor on the channel which was resulted in uh, top and bottom end um, low audio as well and those were replaced then with Elna as with many of these amplifiers I also do a check on the remaining electrolytic capacitors with the ESR meter and all of the other ones you know came within spec there wasn't any sort of concern or anything you know which required additional work so that sort of brings us to a close for this repair tutorial so I do appreciate you stopping by and if you require any support or any assistance email audio amplifier servicing at aol.com and I'll be more than happy to provide any support or guidance that you may require. So until the next time, I wish you all the very best. Cheers and bye-bye.